the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. We all know that Atlas Shrugged is almost a playbook for what's unfolding now. More and more of you are going galt. Yaron Brook, who's head of the Ayn Rand Institute for Human Rights, is going to give us an update on the current state of things and whether he believes a Romney presidency will be a net plus for individual rights, liberty, and property. Hey, Yaron, welcome back. Thanks for having me on again. Hey, you haven't connected since Freedom Fest in Vegas. Been busy, huh? That's right. No, running around, and it only becomes busier from from this point on. Uh, I've got a book coming out September 18th, and it it becomes really hectic after that. But ex- exciting stuff, exciting stuff. Oh, that's great. So, so the book, what's the title? Free Market Revolution: How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. It comes out September 18th. You can already pre-order it in. You know, hardback, an ebook, audiobook, it's all available on Amazon or, or on my blog. So, uh, you know, go out, get a copy, help me get this book on some of the uh, bestseller lists. That would be great. Yes, it would. And who would think that the concept of free markets would be considered revolutionary, a revolutionary concept in America, the, the country that pioneered them and showed the power and their ability to lift people up out of uh, poverty and to lift the human race to new heights. Why should that be a revolution here? Well, I mean, it shouldn't. You're absolutely right. I mean, this country was founded uh, on a revolution, and part of that revolution was the concept of individual rights, which make free markets possible. And indeed, for the first 100, 120, 130 years of this country, we had as as close as we, as anybody's ever had in the world a, a free market, and we saw a small, little, relatively insignificant colony of Great Britain turn into the the wealthiest, most powerful, industrially and, and militarily most powerful nation in the history of mankind. We saw standard of living go through the roof. We saw real incomes go through the roof. We saw massive immigration into this country. So free markets work. And one of the arguments that we're going to make in the book, or we've made in the book, is that one, we don't have a free market in the United States. And I, I know you know that, and I know that, but so many Americans still think we have free markets. That's why they could argue that this financial crisis that just happened was uh, was caused by free markets. I mean, you can think whatever you want to think about the, the, the financial crisis, but you can't blame it on free markets because they haven't existed in this country for about 100 years, over 100 years. So uh, we want to make the case that we, we don't live in a free market today. We want to make the case that free markets work in the sense that they create material wealth like no other system. But much more importantly, and the most significant aspect of the book, is we want to make the argument that free markets are moral, ethically good. They are the only ethical system. Capitalism is the only ethical moral system to organize human activity. Uh, And uh, and that that is the argument that those of us who believe in free markets need to win if we're really going to change course. So, you know, I I think people are going to enjoy the book. It's written very much for kind of a general public. I'm hoping this goes far beyond kind of the regular readers, the, the you know, the converted, right? I mean, the, the, the people who typically buy these books, all the people who really agree with it. I'm really hoping that a lot of people will be challenged by the book, will, will find uh, that it changes their minds and, and that it really has an impact on the debate the country's going through as we approach the election. And then I think a debate that will intensify after the election because whoever wins, we're going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, well, whoever wins, the American public is the big loser, right? Yes, yes. No, that's right. I think the bigger loser of Obama wins. I, I think we, you know, this president is is unique in how bad he is. 
uh, unique in his philosophy. I think he, this is the the most anti-American president in American history from a philosophical perspective. I think this is the first president who is an egalitarian, who who believes in equality for equality's sake. Um, you know, is not motivated by any kind of vision of of well-being, vision of improving life or uh, improving this country, but really about a vision of equality, even if it destroys everybody. And, and destruction is a big part of, I think, the motivating factor for for much of kind of more the more radical left, which I think Obama is a part of. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, so I, you know, Mitt Romney, I think, would slow down the deterioration. Philosophically, he's I hate to say this better than Obama, but he's not good. That is, uh, I think that if we if we get Mitt Romney, we're all going to be disappointed, even though expectations are pretty low to begin with, uh, because he's just he's an empty suit. He, there's just nothing there in terms of ideology, in terms of ideas, in terms of vision. The best we can hope for is that the better elements within the Republican Party uh, will have a significant influence on him to move him in the right direction. Uh, but I, I don't expect dramatic, significant action on the part of a Romney administration. I hope I'm wrong. I very much hope I'm wrong. What I hope he'll do is slow things down so that we can continue the process of educating Americans about what's needed in order to reverse direction, in order to bring about a free market revolution in this country. Yeah, and boy, do we ever need one? Because so many people, I was just talking with uh, Joel Stern, somebody you know, and yep. why would anybody at this point want to add another worker unless they absolutely had to? They just wouldn't do it because they don't know what type of return on their investment, if any, they're going to be allowed to get because of the uncertainty of Obamacare and all sorts of other regulations that are just insane and they're driving people you know, to go galt, to, to just throw up their arms and say, you know what, I've got enough money to live my life out and I'm going to do it and goodbye and you'll be somebody else's problem. I mean, these, these government bureaucracies are just, they don't just destroy companies, they destroy the economy and they destroy people's lives. And I don't think enough people know this. When they sure, and, and let's not dichotomize between companies and people's lives. I mean, companies are just collections of individuals, so there, there, there is no such thing as a company. If you destroy a company, you are by definition destroying lives. The employees, the shareholders, the suppliers, the, all the, the customers, all the people interact, whose lives are destroyed. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the, the policies of, of this administration, but the policies of the Bush administration, the policies of the United States over the last... 50 years, even 100 years, uh, anti-individual, anti-business, uh, anti-success. And Obama is just a culmination of a trend. And it's going to take a lot to reverse this. So, yeah, we could we could probably create, you know, get rid of some of the uncertainty. But, it, but it's not uncertainty that's killing us. It's actually the opposite. I would say it's certainty. It's certainty that things are getting worse. It's certainty that the government is getting bigger. It's certainty that we're over-regulating. It's certainty that, that Dodd-Frank and, and all these other regulatory schemes that the government's involved in are destroying jobs. It's the certainty of these things which is, which is causing people not to invest. And in order to reverse this, what we need is to create a different certain paradigm, a paradigm that says, you know, no, regulations are going to be unwound, taxes are going to be reduced, government spending is going to go down. We are going to free up the American people, uh, you know, to to invest and to prosper and to be entrepreneurs and to do the things that they want to do in order to pursue their values. We're not going to interfere. We're not going to tell them what values they should or shouldn't pursue. We just, as a government, we're going to stay out of this. And you know, that's the kind of certainty we need in term in 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 order to to move the country in the right direction. And let's not set our sights too low. You know, it's not about unemployment. It's about sustainable economic growth, which is only attainable, sustainable economic growth, which is only attainable through uh, a, a constant sustainable rise in the standard of living, which is only attainable through an increase in freedom and a, and, and a constant increase in freedom. That is, we've got such a long way to go. We are so unfree today relative to where we were in our past. 
we have got a lot of undoing to do over the next few decades to get to the point where we can where we can declare success. You know, not only is unemployment down, but our standard of living is dramatically up, and we are freer than we've ever been before. That that should be our goal. Absolutely, I mean, we shouldn't strive for anything less than that. And unfortunately, we haven't had a champion of these values since arguably Reagan. Well, arguably Reagan, because even Reagan, you know, while I think he often championed them verbally, you know, his actions in office don't always support this. Uh, you know, the, the 1980s, a time of heavy regulation of Wall Street and, and a lot of persecution of financiers for no good reason, Michael Milken being a good example of that, under a Republican administration. There was a period of, of government spending growing. Now, you could blame the Democrats in Congress, but Reagan, I would argue, did not do enough to dramatically cut spending. Remember that Reagan came into office saying that he would get rid of a number of governmental departments, including the Department of Education. And when he left office, the Department of Education was bigger than it had ever been before. So uh, while you know Reagan was better than anything we've had since, and, and maybe even before for a very long time, not quite good enough. This is why we need to set our heights very high. We need a we need a political champion who will actually, you know, advocate for real freedom, advocate for the real rollback of government, the real shrinkage of government, and somebody who can articulate the case for individual rights, and therefore the case for limiting government based on the principle of individual rights, so that we can really have the the criteria by which to shrink government. Government should do one thing and one thing only, and that is protect our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that requires very little. That requires cutting government spending by something like 80 to 90% of where it is today. Absolutely. I mean, we've just got all these ridiculous agencies, a lot of whom are working against each other, and they accomplish nothing. And one of the biggest failings of the educational system is the way that FDR has been lionized for saving the country from the Great Depression, and yet there's been numerous work done that actually proves the contrary, that he prolonged the Great Depression, he made it worse than it ever had to be, than it needed to be, and that after 10 years, he all the expansion of federalism of the federal government accomplished absolutely nothing except to increase debt spending and pretty much a decrease of human freedom in those three terms, three and a half terms that, uh, that he was there. And yet history refuses to accept what, what's been proven over and over again. So how do we get that message across that, that FDR really was a failure, a big failure and not a success? Because we can't well, do I mean, that. This is this is why it's so important to to change the intellectual debate and to replace the intellectuals that we have today because it's the intellectuals who teach our teachers it's intellectuals in the universities and in our magazines and in our newspapers who continuously praise fdi in spite of all the evidence and and that's because it's dominated by by the left you know and the leftists are you know, they, the truth is, they, they would argue the truth is completely subjective. There is no, there are no absolutes. There is no real reality. You make it up as you go along. So who says that FDR was a failure? So, you know, that whole mentality, that whole philosophy, that whole view of looking at the world, the, the, the subjectivist epistemology, the, the idea that you can make make up history, the postmodernism, that has to be rejected outright. And I think, unfortunately, the freedom movement has not really engaged with these philosophical issues. But we can't win unless there is an objective reality, unless there's real history, unless we can point to that real history and convince students who be taught, well, no, there isn't such a thing. So we need to replace the philosophers. We need to replace the professors. We need to replace the intellectuals. We need to change the debate uh, about about what history is and then what are the facts of history. And then I, I think also people's perception of history is shaped by the moral code. And I think that people who have grown up and raised with the idea that, uh, you know, sacrificing for country, sacrificing for your fellow man is noble and, and wonderful, 
you know, look at what FDR did. He asked for sacrifices. Isn't that a good thing? That's wonderful. So it didn't work exactly the way he wanted it to, but he's still a good guy because he asked for the sacrifices. And of course, Obama doesn't end the speech without the idea of shared sacrifice. And I have to say, neither did George Bush. So the idea of sacrificing for your fellow man, for the country, for the state, that is what really needs to be challenged. And as long as people hold that as a moral ideal, we have no chance of winning, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm afraid that's so. So the book, uh, it's coming out real soon, and we expect to see you around uh, promoting it. And hopefully it's going to spark the debate that we really need to have, which is about freedom and about free markets so that you can pursue your goals without being harassed and without uh, the jackboot of the government literally on your neck. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and if people want to kind of keep track of my various, you know, I'm hoping I'll be able to do a lot of media and a lot of, a lot of public appearances, uh, speeches and so on. If they want to follow that, then the blog is probably the best place to go. It's, it's capitalism. Einrand.org. Or they can, you know, they can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'll be updating my status regularly there. It's Yaron Brook, Y-A-R-O-N-B-R-O-O-K on Twitter, and Y Brook or Yaron Brook on uh, on Facebook. All right. Well, hey, Yaron, thanks so much for being on FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com to hear this interview, as well as a number of others we've done with Yaron, as well as many financial luminaries around the world financialsurvivalnetwork.com. You're on. Good luck on the book, and we will talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.